Good afternoon. I'm Gina Turrigiano, president of the Society for Neuroscience. It's so wonderful to see all of you here. Welcome to the presentation of the 19th annual Gruber Neuroscience Prize on which the Society for Neuroscience is pleased to collaborate. The Gruber Foundation presents three annual $500,000 prizes in the fields of cosmology, genetics, and neuroscience. Sarah Reha, the executive director of the foundation, will say more. Sarah? Thank you, Dr. Trogiano. We are delighted to present the 2022 Neuroscience Prize at SFN's 51st annual meeting and to continue to work with the society. The Gruber International Prize Program, established in 2000, recognizes achievements and discoveries that produce fundamental shifts in human knowledge and culture. While we are here to honor Larry Abbott, Emery Neil Brown, Terence Sejnowski, and Heim Somplinski, let me mention that they join Cosmology Prize recipient Frank Eisenhower and Genetics Prize recipients Ruth Lehman, James Priest, and Geraldine Seydoux on our 2022 roster. Please also note that nominations to the 2023 Gruber Prizes are open until December 15, 2022, and that we encourage nominations that reflect the breadth of the fields and the diversity of those working within them. Before we return to neuroscience, I simply must acknowledge our co-founders, Peter and Patricia Gruber, whose combined vision and leadership established the Interna International Prize Program, and whose care in doing so gave it the legs to stand on its own. We are grateful to SFN for its support of the Gruber Prize, but also for its support of the International Research Award in Neuroscience that we fund. Let me now ask Gina Torrigiano back to the stand to present these year's fellows. Thank you, Sarah. It's now my great honor to present the Peter and Patricia Gruber International Research Award in Neuroscience. Each year, this award recognizes two promising young neuroscientists for outstanding research and educational pursuit in an international setting. This year's recipients are Dr. Mariana Zazitske and Dr. Manuel Valero. Dr. Mariana Zazitska is a postdoctoral fellow in the Zuckerman Brain Mind Behavior Institute at Columbia University. She completed her doctoral work at the University of Lausanne. Dr. Zazitska was trained as a geneticist and transitioned to neuroscience with the goal of understanding the molecular mechanisms underlying the loss of smell in disease. She was able to demonstrate that the olfactory deficits in Alzheimer's disease are due to disruptions of the interactions between olfactory genes on different chromosomes. During the pandemic, Dr. Zaziska pivoted her research to focus on how and why COVID causes a rapid and acute loss of smell, something I'm sure many of us in the room experienced personally. She and her team demonstrated that within days of exposure to the virus, the expression of olfactory receptor genes is turned off. The award selection committee was unanimously impressed by Dr. Zazitska's accomplishments, including her pioneering and innovative work on the molecular mechanisms of the loss of smell, and her fearlessness in moving her research in new directions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zazitska. Our next recipient is Dr. Manuel Valero. Dr. Valero is a postdoctoral fellow at the NYU Neuroscience Institute in the Langone Medical Center. He completed at NYU. He completed his doctoral work at the University of Madrid. Regarding Dr. Valero, the selection committee remarked, it's been known for quite a while that the brain reboots itself thousands of times each night with rhythmic transitions between silent down states and active upstates. The downstate is so-called because of the generally accepted notion that neurons do not fire during these silent periods. Dr. Manuel Valero challenged this long-standing assumption by identifying a specific class of neuron that fires exclusively during this silent state, 
which he called downstate active, or DSA neurons. He went on to molecularly characterize the DSAs and was able to show that the activity of DSA neurons contributes to the prolongation of the downstate and that silencing them interfered with memory in a visual discrimination task. More recently, Dr. Valero pioneered a transformative technique for probing subthreshold dynamics in large populations of neurons that does not require intracellular access. The award selection committee was unanimously impressed by Dr. Valero's creativity and drive. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Valero. Now, we have the presentation of the Gruber si Prize in Neuroscience. Sarah? Okay. Congratulations to our 2022 fellows. Perhaps we'll see you back up here someday receiving the Neuroscience Prize. Our 2022 Neuroscience Prize recipients were chosen by our Distinguished Advisory Board. These volunteer advisors bring their priceless experience and their in irrepressible enthusiasm for science to the selection process. Um, and they are also nominated to us by SFN. We could not do this without them. Let me now ask our board chair, Francis Jensen, to read the official citation to the prize uh, drafted by the selection advisory board and add any further remarks. Dr. Jensen. Thank you very much, Sarah, and um, it is an enormous honor to read uh, the Gruber Foundation uh, prize text. The Gruber Foundation proudly presents the 2022 Neuroscience Prize to Larry Abbott, Emery Neal Brown, Terry Sainowski, Heim Sampolinski for seminal contributions to computational and theoretical neuroscience. These fields are playing increasingly important roles in helping us understand the brain as data sets get so large and complex that they can no longer be grasped intuitively. Bringing their expertise in physics, machine learning, and statistics to neuroscience, each has generated theories, models, and tools that are now widely used. Among them are Abbott's models of homeostatic plasticity, olfactory processing and learning in networks, Brown's methods for decoding spike trains in behaving animals and analyzing synchronized oscillations during anesthesia, Sainowski's independent component analysis method for distributing complex data into separate channels, and Sampolinsky's attractor and bound state network models of complex circuit function. So this is presented on this 13th day of November. I would just like to add before we bring uh, the, our recipients. Um, a few words on behalf of the uh, prize committee that you just saw, my colleagues. Um, we just, when we debated uh, for this incredible honor, um, we felt that computational neuroscience has been emerging over the last decades as critical to so many aspects of our field. The prize committee determined that it has achieved, at this point, a major milestone moment which merits recognition. Given the complexity of the tasks at hand, it is a privilege to honor these four pioneers who in aggregate cover the spectrum from molecular and cellular function, structure and circuits, circuits and behavioral systems, and physiology and implementation. Please join me in congratulating and receiving our four recipients of the 2022 Gruber Neuroscience Prize. So we are going to award um, with uh, a, um, our, the prize material uh, to our uh, four prize winners, Larry Abbott, Emery Neal Brown, Terry Sainowski, and Heim Sompolinski for this prize. <laughs> 
We've never had four recipients before. <laughs> it speaks to the magnitude of the field. After the four 15-minute lectures, there will be a 15-minute discussion with the recipients, moderated by prize advisors Francis Jensen and Ikue Mori. Um, Professor Sinowski? Well, it is a great honor to be here tonight to receive this prize along with my colleagues. But really, it's not just us who are being honored. It is our field of computational neuroscience, which is one of the youngest areas of neuroscience. Today, I'm going to be telling you about the precision of synaptic plasticity. And it's part of a long-standing collaboration with the Kristen Harris Lab in UT Austin. And more recently with Cliff Abraham, who is uh, in New Zealand, and in my lab, Tom Bartol and Mohamed Samavat. We were asked to declare a conflict of interest. Our lab has no interest other than in science. <laughs> so there are many levels of investigation that one can study the brain. This lecture is going to be focused primarily on the bottom half and specifically the synapses, of which there are uh, tens of the 14, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's an enormous astronomical number. It's really the computational unit of the brain. The other lectures, uh, as you'll see, will be talking about neural circuits, about systems, and about behavior. So this is uh, really, we're covering the entire spectrum. We're going to focus on the hippocampus in this lecture, and specifically on area CA1, which is probably the part of the hippocampus where the synapses have been the most intensively studied, specifically for synaptic plasticity, long-term potentiation. So Kristen Harris and, and her group uh, serially reconstructed a very tiny little piece of the CA3 neuropil, uh, which was six by six by five cubic microns, but we reconstructed it in a very, very high definition. All of the constituent parts, there are over 400 synapses uh, and, and many dendritic fragments as well as axons and one glial cell. And I'm gonna demonstrate that for you here. This is actually just two large dendrites, one green, one yellow, one axon in blue, and then the gossamer is the small part of the Astrocyte. So the, the green dendrite has 75 synaptic spines on it, protuberances coming out, uh, and that means about 15 per micron, which is really quite dense. So here's a close up of what a spine looks like it's a protuberance with a neck and a head, and then it abuts the uh, presynaptic bouton which releases a neurotransmitter uh, with receptors on the head of the spine head. Now, we're going to be focusing on, on that spine head. 
Chuck Stevens uh, very uh, sadly died a few uh, months ago, just one month ago, uh, but he, you know, many years ago showed that the strength of the synapse, the electrical signal, was uh, very str strongly correlated with the volume, the size of the spine head, shown here in pink. And he also showed that the probability of release of a single vesicle was also proportional to the strength of the synapse. So this is a very important part of this talk. So here are the spine sizes, the distribution of the number as a function of the head volume. You can see that it's skewed to the left, a lot of small ones, 80, 90% are small. And there's a long tail, so these are giant uh, synapses on the right. Now, I'm going to ask a question that's very difficult to answer. We know a lot about plasticity, but what about the, the, the precision? And how would we even go about studying that? Well, here's a Gedanken experiment, which, which physicists use, they call it a, it's a thought experiment, in order to be able to focus in on what the problem is and see if there might be a, a way forward. So here's a, an ideal dendrite. You can see it's very straight. Uh, <clears throat> two axons forming synapses. We're going to assume that those are independent axons that we can stimulate independently. And uh, they form synapses on that dendrite. So the ideal experiment would be to stimulate the two axons with identical trains of stimuli. And then, after the plasticity has taken place, examine the strength of the two synapses. And if the precision is perfect, those two synapses should have the same strength and correspondingly the same spine head size. Well, serendipitously, as we were reconstructing this little volume, we came across a number of axons passing through Schaffer collaterals, forming not one, but two synapses onto the same dendritic shaft. And this gave us the ideal experiment to test the precision. Well, why is that? It's because the axon will c carry the same input, the same uh, train of action potentials to both synapses, and on the postsynaptic side, they will have the same membrane potential. And the synaptic strength is thought to be a function of those two variables on the pre- and postsynaptic side. So we, all we need to do now is to look at the, the volumes of the, of the two of the pair of synapses, same axon, same dendrite. We found 10 pairs. And they're illustrated here on the left. And you can just see by scanning it that if one is small, so is the other. If it's medium, so is the other. And if it's large, so is the other. And if you plot them against each other on a log-log scale, you can see they fall along a straight line with really extraordinary precision. The coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation divided by the mean, is 0.083. And some of that is probably measurement error. Now, we want to quantify this, and we want to quantify it in a way that uh, engineers would, which is to say, in terms of information theory. And Mohamed Sambavad, who's a graduate student in electrical engineering, worked out a, a very elegant way to, to do that, to find out how many bits of information you can store through distinguishable synapse, uh, synapse strengths uh, at, as a consequence of plasticity. So the first thing he did was to create a histogram in which each of the bouton, each of the spine heads uh, within the column were within a standard, within a CV of the, all the others. And when you do that, you come up with 24 clusters, each of which is indistinguishable within, the, within each of the clusters. And that corresponds to about 4.1 bits per synapse, which is much higher than I could have guessed earlier, and most neuroscientists were surprised. Uh, if you want to hear more, uh, Mohammed is giving a talk on Wednesday at 10.15 uh, in, the, in the convention center. Now, Cliff Abraham took it one step further, uh, looking at another part of the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, and specifically performing LTP experiments on the granule cells. And what you can see here, there are uh, two animals in which he stimulated uh, with a theta burst stimulus producing an increase of about 40% in the strengths and sacrificed after 30 minutes and then another two rats that were sacrificed after two hours. So we have two control points to actually examine now what the, uh, the volumes were of the spine heads. So here is on the left an example 
of the spine head in yellow and the PSD in red. And here is the control on the left. You can see the skew distribution. And here now after LTP in the median medial uh, molecular layer, uh, you, you can see that, that the, uh, there's a much longer tail here going much further out which is the potentiation. But notice that also there are, the small ones are bunching up. It's as if the, some of them went to the, to, the, to the right and some went to the left over a broader range. Now, if we did the same analysis, we find that for the control case, there are only five clusters. That is to say, only two bits per synapse. And what this shows is that different parts of the brain, the synapses, are going to have different ability to store information. It's about four times less information than in CA1. Uh, and after LTP, however, it doubles to about three bits per synapse, 10 clusters. Now, what about two hours? So within the experimental uh, you know, the significance, it's, uh, the control is the same, you can see, and so is the LTP condition. So that's interesting. Over that period of time, more than an hour, the, uh, the, the distributions are, are preserved in terms of the amount of information that was stored. So here are the distributions, and you can see the control, uh, and also now uh, on the left, the 30-minute LTP in red, and the two-hour on the right. Now, if you look at these distributions, they're not quite the same, even though they have the same uh, number of bits per, per synapse. And that's because what's happening is really interesting. Between 30 minutes and two hours, do you see this flat line across? Well, it turns out that for the res with respect to information theory, the optimal use of, of all the, the different sizes is for all of them to be equally represented, for the distribution to be flat. And so one can measure the difference between the red distribution and the flat distribution, and that's called entropy. And if you analyze the entropy for 30 minutes compared to the two hours, you find that over that next of hour and a half, the entropy increases, even though you know, in the distribution you can see actually it changes. So this means that uh, what's happening during that time is that the distinguishable states are being optimized for being able to represent all the different sizes uh, equally. So uh, what about other parts of the brain? Well, here's an experiment that was done uh, by Clay Reed. He reconstructed a cubic millimeter of cerebral cortex, which had many, many, many more synapses, about a billion synapses. And from that, uh, Sebastian Tsiung was able to reconstruct and measure the volumes of the spine heads. Now, what's different from their <laughs> measurements and ours is that we had all, both synapses on the same dendritic shaft, whereas they were looking at synapses on different dendritic branches uh, from between you know, one to 10 individual branches that received synaptic input from the same presynaptic neuron. But what you can see is that despite the fact that it was much more broadly represented and probably the membrane potential is quite different, there nonetheless is a clustering along the diagonal. And interestingly, if you look at the uh, distributions, it looks as if it may be bimodal. So that's interesting. It means that there may be uh, two groups, the small ones and the big ones. And so we went back and looked at our data. So here is the histogram for our data. And if you squint, you could probably see a little bump there. <laughs> Not, we don't have quite as many synapses as they have, but I think that it may be that the hippocampus has a similar bimodality. But within, we know from these experiments, that within each of these uh, peaks, that the differences between these different uh, clusters actually are distinguishable. So they're distinguishable. The small ones are as distinguishable as the big ones. Now, there's a fly in the ointment which is that I told you that the uh, presynaptic action potentials were the same, but the probability of release is different depending on the strength of the synapse. The smaller synapses have a probability of release of about 10 to 20 percent, something that Chuck Stevens also discovered. And the big ones, perhaps 50 to 60 percent. Now, how could, that means they didn't see exactly the same input. The, the synapses were seeing different releases at different times. So one way that they probably have to be able to uh, you know, reconcile that is to average over time. And there is a molecule, uh, CAMP kinase 2, which uh, 
Mary Kennedy discovered at Caltech, which uh, it's a dodecamer, it's a huge molecule, and it binds uh, to calcium calmodulin. So calcium comes in, it triggers plasticity, binds to calmodulin, calmodulin binds the, the, the subunits of CAMP kinase 2, which then causes conformational changes, as you can see here from the side, Release, really, revealing other phosphorylation sites and the subunits can phosphorylate itself and there's a tremendous number of, in, of internal states, 10 to the 20th states. And so we modeled this uh, with a simple differential, set of differential equations, Miriam Ordium, and, uh, and she indeed found that uh, it looked like a calcium integrator. It was integrating calcium as it came in and not just uh, in terms of how much calcium but also the timing of the calcium. And so the, the, we're now collaborating with Mary Kennedy and uh, uh, Tom Bartol and Padmini Rangamani at UCSD to do a particle-based version of this, uh, taking into account the spatial location of CAM kinase 2. So I uh, want to thank everyone, especially uh, the, the foundations that have supported us. The uh, Schwartz Foundation has a a postdoctoral program that, a center's program that has been very influential in our field. And the Neuronext Brain Initiative in particular has supported this work that I've just showed you tonight. And thank you very much. I would like to begin by uh, thanking the Gruber Foundation, Patricia Gruber, the Neuroscience Selection Advisory uh, Board, um, and also uh, the institutions that uh, provided uh, generous research support uh, to our work. I would like to begin the discussion about reminding us that uh, the brain is constantly bombarded by rich stimuli, from visual objects to sounds of different types to smell. We are navigating in a rich uh, spatial environment, uh, and we recall vividly uh, past experiences. So what I would like to discuss is how the brain represents and processes uh, such richness of stimuli. So historically, neuroscientists uh, view this problem through the lens of uh, single neurons. Famous examples are the receptive field mappings by Hartline in the retina, and later on by Ubel and Wiesel in primary visual cortex. They also mapped the selectivity of single neurons to uh, variation of uh, features of stimuli within the receptive field, and they constructed a relatively simple synaptic mechanisms uh, focusing on the convergence of uh, synapses onto a single postsynaptic neuron. Let's uh, fast forward to today, to the present, and today uh, experimentalists uh, are able to record a simultaneous activity of hundreds to thousands to millions of neurons in specific systems like the grid uh, module uh, in the medial and torrinal cortex, uh, to decision-making uh, uh, systems, to whole brain uh, activity by calcium imaging, uh, to bold activity of the human language systems using fMRI. So all these are um, rather different perspective or window into the brain activity. So conceptually, we can uh, visualize or describe a snapshot uh, of the population activity as a point or vector in high-dimensional uh, vector space, uh, state space of the, of the system, where each coordinate in this high-dimensional space uh, code or uh, represents the activity or the level of activity of individual neurons. However, as time varies, as conditions vary, we expect or suspect that this will generate a complex mess of clouds in high dimension, uh, which is unclear how to interpret. 
So this raises the following questions. How do we analyze the activity patterns of a large population of neurons? What kind of theories and models are appropriate? And I would like to argue that uh, we should focus on collective population-level computations uh, and try to find hidden low-dimensional structures within this high-dimensional space. One of the most influential models of neural collective computation is the John Hopfield model of associative memory. Uh, in this model, memories are attractors, stable fixed points, namely their stable states under the dynamics of the neural circuit, as is shown here. The circuit mechanism is Hebbian synaptic plasticity during encoding of memories and neuronal nonlinearities. So under this picture, although the individual instantaneous uh, Uh, activities are a cloud of points in high-dimensional space, the stable points, the memories, are actually represented simply as a discrete set of points, memory one, memory two, memory three, etc., in this high-dimensional space. This is good for discrete memories like episodic memory. But often we, uh, in our online uh, activities, Uh, the brain has to hold continuous sensory motor variables in working memory, like angle, directions, distance, sizes, locations, etc. So can we extend the notion of attractors from discrete points to continuous variables? And one of the simplest examples of such uh, a, a, a transition or extension is the neuronal circuits coding for an angle what's known as the ring attractor or the ring attractor manifold. This can be orientation tuning, this can be uh, head direction uh, of the animal, or spatial working memory of stimuli arranged in, in a circle, or in a motor system, the uh, control of the direction of uh, our movement. So, the model, the ring model, proposes that In, under certain, uh, under appropriate circumstances, the network exhibits a, a continuum of states. Each one of them is bump state located in a given position or angle along the ring, but the bump can move around or can be stable anywhere along the ring. So this causes then the appearance of ring attractor manifold. The mechanism of the circuit, it's a Mexican head recurrent interaction profile where each neuron in this ring excites its neighbors but inhibits the rest. So in this case, we again collapse the high dimensional cloud of points into low dimensional or ring of attractor points. This for many years have been, uh, has been a theoretical hypothesis. But fortunately, recently, this has been the ring attractor has been, has been uh, uh, experimentally realized in the fly brain. So, uh, lab laboratories in Genelia uh, have been uh, imaging the activity of the fly, the calcium imaging uh, methods, uh, the activity of the fly when it's head fixed and running over a ball, and I'll come to the activity uh, in a moment. Uh, but later on, they were actually able to EM reconstruct the entire circuit of the COMPASS network. And the, as you can see from this picture, it's beautifully, the processes of the neuron are beautifully aligned along a ring structure. In terms of the activity, as you can see here, as the fly moves uh, on the ball, the, the angular visual uh, world moves al along with him, And very nicely, you see the bump of activity moves along the ring to track the uh, visual, uh, visual cues in this case. It's not only tracking the visual cues, but also tracking self-motion in darkness, and also are stable, the bumps are stable in the absence of cues, just like the ring models propose. So this is for one dimension, for one angle. How about higher dimensions? So now we move to neuronal circuits that code for two-dimensional spatial self-location. And here the model suggests that we will see torus attractor manifold. Basically, under appropriate conditions, for each, uh, in a given moment of time, the activity of the network uh, 
has multiple bumps arranged in hexagonal grid, but the bump, the, 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 this pattern can move uh, and shift in both x and y direction. However, when it comes to the next bump in the, in the ring in both directions, the, the pattern becomes uh, uh, the same, repeats itself, and therefore, uh, the prediction is that this manifold of attractor points now will be in the topology of a torus, where in both x and y direction, uh, they will repeat themselves periodically. And the mechanism here is, again, simple, is a two-dimensional Mexican hat interactions, again, excite, to excite, exciting nearest uh, and near, nearby neurons in both uh, dimensions and uh, inhibits the others. So now we expect that the high dimensional cloud shrinks into a low dimensional attractor manifold of uh, a toes structure. And again, uh, fortunately, this hypothesis has been recently discovered in the real brain of the uh, of the rodent. So Gardner, uh, in the lab of uh, the Mosers, uh, have uh, recorded single neuron grid, grid cells in the, uh, in the medial and torrinal cortex and selected one module of about 150 neurons uh, of, of, of grid cells and mapped them into high-dimensional activities, as I described earlier. But then they used a sophisticated nonlinear dimensionality reduction to reduce it to lower dimension and discover beautiful toroidal structure, as you can see uh, in these plots from different perspectives. And this happens in the open field for aging, uh, walking on a circular maze, and REM sleep and slow wave sleep. So this is really a, a, a demonstration of intrinsic attractors, uh, stable states, which uh, together have the topology of the, uh, of the torus. So let me move to my last example, and this is how does the visual cortex represent objects? So here is the cartoon of the visual hierarchy from the retina to various stages, V1, V2, V4, culminating in IT cortex, uh, which is known to be selective to uh, faces and objects. So here the question is, how the brain copes with the following problem? On the one hand side, the brain must be able to distinguish between dogs and cats and houses, etc. But on the other hand, each one of these discrete categories come with many different flavors, continuously varying pose, angle, distance, scale, sizes, etc. As you can see, this cartoon. So the, the Manifold, objective manifold hypothesis or model proposes that the IT cortex uh, organizes the uh, responses to uh, object stimuli in discrete multiple manifolds. They are well separated, so the, the brain can easily discriminate between different objects. However, they are not completely collapses to, uh, to a point so the brain has also available information about the variation in physical variables. Circuit mechanism here is a series of adapted synaptic projections along the ventral pathway. This is not a recurrent network model, so these are not attractors, but nevertheless, the points in a manifold are united, but not by the dynamics of the recurrent network, by, the, by them be sharing the same label, the same discrete uh, concept or object category. Furthermore, the theory uh, predicts that there are two key geometric characteristics of these manifolds, object manifolds. One is their size of within manifold variability, the extent of the variability normalized by the distance between manifolds, and manifold dimension, so this will be the manifold radius, and manifold dimension is the number of directions occupied by the manifold. And the theory predicts that to perform well object identity tasks, like object recognition or discrimination of objects, or learning uh, new uh, object categories, object radius should shrink along the visual hierarchy. Object dimension, on the other hand, desired change whether it's uh, it better to have lower dimension or high dimension, 
really change, uh, really depends on the particular object identity task. So we said to uh, test this, I these ideas, these predictions with uh, 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 real data. And the data comes from Jim DeCarlo's lab, who presented uh, monkeys with thousands of images organized uh, in, in uh, 64 object categories, but different orientation, different scale, as is shown here. And what we did is take these images, take the neural responses in IT Cortex and V4 as measured in Jim DeCarlo's lab, and compare the emerging manifold geometries to the geometries that would, would, would come out of the same stimuli, the same images, if you propagate them into deep networks. These are AI deep convolutional networks which are trained to uh, perform object recognition tasks. So we take the same images, propagate through the networks, and measure their geometry. And here are the results that we have. So what you see on the left-hand side is the mean manifold radii as a function of the location along the, along the network or the depth. So zero will be the, the eye, and one will be the feature layer or something similar to uh, IT cortex in the real brain. And as you can see, the manifold radii, as expected, shrink monotonically, systematically, from the input to the output uh, of the visual hierarchy in both artificial network and also in the, in, in the real brain. Also, you can see that manifold dimensionality, as suspected from the theory, doesn't have a clear-cut, such a clear-cut behavior. It initially, it increases and then later on decreases again as you go to the output layers. You can also see that IT cortex geometry, as measured by the neuronal responses in the real brain of the macaque, has very similar features in terms of geometry, radius, and dimension to some of the networks. These are the network with high-performing uh, object recognition tasks, but not to a network with relatively poor or, or mediocre or, uh, 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 performance uh, called AlexNet. So ResNet are the high-performing artificial neural networks, and they fit very well with the, uh, with the responses measured by the IT cortex. Also, you can see that V4, particularly V4 dimension, dimension in the manifolds of the intermediate stage V4, really lie outside the range of all the dimensions, all the stages of the artificial uh, neural networks. So this more broadly uh, uh, points to the fact that both agreement and discrepancy between real biological circuits and artificial networks, both discrepancies and agreement uh, may give us clues how to uh, better understand uh, uh, representations uh, in the brain. So I want to close with these examples uh, as my beginning, and I, I hope I, uh, I have convinced you that by the study of the neuron manifolds and their topology and geometry, uh, this study helps us in uncovering some of the principles underlying complex brain function. And I would like to uh, end by quoting uh, an inspiration quote from uh, Galileo Galilei, who understands geometry, is able to understand everything in this world. Galilei used a telescope and geometry. Neuroscientists are using microscope and geometry to understand their world, the world of the brain. Finally, I would like to thank my collaborators uh, in the uh, project trying to understand neural mechanisms in visual cognition. I would like to thank Edward Moser, Vivek Jayaraman, and Joram Burak for contributing material uh, to my presentation. And last but not least, I would like to thank my wife, Elisheva Sompolinski, for her love, partnership, and support that allowed me to devote my time to academic research and education. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, my, my uh, talk has an alternate title that I'd like to give, which is Beauty is in the Brain of the Beheld. Um, the reason for this is because I'm going to talk about beauty. I think everybody can recognize the biological beauty in this picture of a, of a set of cells uh, and their, their ex, uh, ex, extensive structure, their elaborate structure. Uh, but there are other kinds of beauty. Um, for example, uh, mathematicians, I think, generally would look at this equation, which rela relates exponentials to sines and cosines, as one of the most beautiful equations in mathematics. Now, what makes a theoretical neuroscientist happy uh, is when these two coincide, um, and you can actually describe the beauty in, in biology and the beauty in math at the same time. And I'm going to take you through an example of that. So what is this a, a paragon of beauty that I've shown you here? Uh, it's from a fly brain. It's from a region called the central complex, which is responsible for uh, helping the fly navigate through the world. The gray areas that you see are, are elements of the central complex. This particular set of neurons is called PFNA, but you don't need to know that for my talk. Um, and the, this picture and an extensive understanding of the, the structures in the, in the central complex comes from this beautiful monumental study from Vivek Jayaraman's lab uh, of the uh, connectome of the central complex. Haim already mentioned this. What I want to do in my talk is to add to this anatomical understanding uh, some of the physiology um, and then show you the deep mathematical underpinnings that are really very elegant and involve all sorts of trigonometric identities that follow from the equation on the bottom. So this uh, circuitry is responsible for navigation, so I thought I'd give you a little example uh, that might be occurring to you. So here you are out on the waterfront by the, uh, by the, the, uh, by the uh, convention center here. Maybe you're walking along like this, and you notice that the ocean is on your left, and, and then you recall, wait a minute, the ocean is kind of on the west side, and the, uh, the convention center is on the east side, so I better make a turn. So that's a little navigation you might be doing in the, in the coming days. Um, in Vanessa Ruta's lab, very similar navigation is being done by flies in a virtual environment. So these are flies on a ball. Uh, there is a wind that blows at them that is closed loop coupled to their motion, so it, it appears to them as a constant wind. And then there's an odor introduced uh, in the geometry that's described by this colored band. So there's a virtual odor plume that the flies track, and what you're seeing in the black line is the fly tracking the edge of the odor plume, which is what they do. Now, if we focus in on one of these little detours that the fly takes, and we imagine that the fly is at that point, um, let's say facing in this direction, we have at least some preliminary evidence that there's a signal in the central complex that tells the fly that the odor plume is on its right, that the direction back is that way, and that directs the fly to then make a turn and follow the path back to the plume. And at the very end, I'll very quickly talk about cells that actually generate that turning signal. Now, on the basis of these data and our understanding of the central complex, Mini Sun in my group has developed a circuit model of what's going on when the fly uh, does this behavior. And as you can see, the, the virtual fly tracks odor plumes in a very similar manner to the real fly. So now let me get back to the beautiful uh, circuitry that I showed you at the beginning. So what does this set of neurons actually do? So imagine that there's a fly out in a sunny day like this. It has a wind blowing in its face. Um, that wind is, is sensed by the antennae of the fly. And from the sensory system, the fly can then determine, is that wind from the left or the right of my body? But for navigational purposes, the fly might want to know where is that wind coming from in the world? Where is it relative to other objects around me, like the sun? Now, Haim already introduced you to this compass system that Selig and Jairaman discovered, um, which is a system in the fly brain, and in fact in the central complex, that tracks landmarks in the world. 
And by combining the wind signal and the landmark signal, the fly can uh, determine how the wind is oriented in the, in the world, not just in relative to its body. So what it's doing is kind of getting an east-west picture of the wind rather than a left-right picture of the wind. Or we can think of this as a transformation of the wind signal from body-centered or egocentric coordinates into world or allocentric coordinates. And that's what this set of neurons does. So now the question is, how does it do it? First of all, um, let me add to these two uh, structures in the central complex this compass system, what's called the ellipsoid body, that Heim introduced you to. Um, that is parameterized by an angle. It, it can track landmarks all the way around the, the body of the fly that goes from 0 to 360 degrees. And that angular labeling applies to all of these structures, the protocerebral bridge that's in the middle of my diagram, and at the bottom, the fan-shaped body. So, so there are angles uh, uh, describing these things, and the, the landmark or the heading signal that Heim described gets transmitted down to other cells in this protocerebral bridge. Now, uh, experimentalists can image the activity of those cells. This would be like uh, looking at the different colors in the diagram on the left. The different colors are cells that innervate what are called different columns of these structures. Um, and just plotting out their activity in space, and if, as you go across the structure, you see a nice sinusoidal pattern of activity. Now, this is not an accident that this happens. They're actually a special group of neurons, a set of neurons, you're seeing one of them here, that have a very interesting structure in the, uh, in the connectome. And that is that if you look at the number of synapses they make as a function of this angular label that, that I described, uh, you get a beautiful cosine shape. Um, now, that has an interesting property, that if you put in virtually any signal and you pass it through a set of synapses like this, out will come a sinusoid. This is actually a trick that Heim used when he, when he constructed the ring model that he talked about. And it, it is a trick that is based on this beautiful mathematical equation. It's a direct result that this happens of that equation. So why do, sin, uh, why do fly brains like sinusoidal patterns of activity so much? So just to remind you, again, you have an array of cells across a structure. If you plot their activity, it goes up and down as you move across that structure, and what you get is a sinusoidal pattern. That sinusoidal pattern has a phase, like this, where the peak is, and it has an amplitude. And there's a direct map of the amplitude and phase of that sine wave to the length and the angle of a vector like the wind direction um, in, in the world. Uh, this is called a phasor representation, and the key to really understanding the navigational con uh, computations of the central complex is in realizing that it represents two-dimensional vectors as sinusoidal patterns of activity. Now, I want to today go beyond that and not just say how are vectors represented, but how are computations performed by this system. So I'll have to uh, follow this signal, this sinusoidal pattern signal, as it travels down into the fan-shaped body, which is really the heavy-duty calculator of this system. Now, if you look at that beautiful equation, it involves cosines and sines, namely sinusoids that are split from each other by 90 degrees. But what I've shown you in blue and red are really just two sinusoids that are identical. So we have to follow them down into the fan-shaped body. And in order to see how that happens, I'm going to re-show you the diagram or the picture on the left with much less cells in it. So in fact, with just two cells in it. So if you track these two cells, they're just two of the many cells that I showed you on the pre previous uh, slide. If you track these down and you line the columns, these guys should really project to the midline here. But they don't. They miss the midline. They're, they're shifted over. And they're shifted over by an amount that's separated by exactly 90 degrees. So what does that mean? That means that when these signals are sent down by the axons of these cells into the fan-shaped body, they get slid over, they get shifted because of this uh, misalignment. The red one likewise gets sent down, but shifted over and in the opposite direction. And when that happens, what ends up is that you get a sine and a cosine. You get this 90-degree shifted pair. 
So the, the fly has not only realized that sinusoid and cosines are, are interesting, but that cosine-sine pairs are interesting. If you want to think about the vector analogy that I gave, you can think of these identical sinusoids that are up on the top of my diagram as two identical vectors being represented. They both have the same phase, they both have the same amplitude. But as they are transported down into this lower structure, they're rotated in such a way that they became, become 90 degrees separated, and they form a little basis. They form an orthogonal basis, actually. So it's beautifully constructed a nice cosine sine or, or orthogonal basis set for representing other quantities and for doing co computations. Now, if I add to this the fact that uh, information like information about the wind, the, the wind direction and the wind amplitude, also comes into this system in the form of sines and cosines that I've drawn here on the bottom. What you realize is you have tons of sines and cosines here, um, and you can start playing the games that follow from this thing. You can start doing um, various trigonometric identities. So the whole thing has been set up uh, at least to give you the raw materials that you need uh, to do some a little trigonometry. Okay, now what you need at this point is some physiology to understand how are these signals combined, because the, the trigonometric identities involve combinations of cosines and sines. And for that, um, I'm going to rely on work done in Gabby Maiman's lab on these exact cell types, uh, measuring their physiological properties, which are very interesting. I don't have time to describe them here, but they have uh, complex properties. I'll mention one of them. And if you take all of these results, you know what the inputs look like, you know how they're being manipulated by the nonlinear properties of the physiology here, and you express them mathematically, you get an expression that looks like this. Um, what you see here is the wind coming in from the antennae, the wind signal, as a sinusoid, as I said, um, and this is this like a left-right wind signal. You also see this landmark signal, that's the, the heading signal, that's coming from this um, compass system that, that, that Heim talked about and I talked about earlier. Um, and you have that coming in as a sinusoid, and then you have this shifting trick that I showed you, uh, duplicating these signals and turning into a sine-cosine pair. So this mathematical expression sort of summarizes what all the anatomy and physiology are doing. And now comes the magic. Um, because I, what I said to you that these cells do is they combine these signals in such a way to give you the wind direction relative to the landmark, not relative to the body, but relative to the landmark. Well, if you do a little trigonometry here, uh, oh, I, I should mention one thing. It's very important here that there's a squaring operation in this formula, and that arises in part because these particular cells express at very high level a T-type calcium channel. So the physiology really comes into this equation. Okay, anyway, if you do the trigonometry, you, you can reduce this expression uh, to the right-hand side, and that there, the, the difference between the wind angle and the, and the landmark angle, is exactly the quantity that, that these cells calculate. It's the wind in sort of an east-west, world-centered uh, uh, sense. Okay, so my, my purpose here was not to lose you in the math, which I probably did, but just to say that we can understand what's going on in the anatomy of these cells and then the physiology of these cells if we look at how the signals are combined and we do a little trigonometry. Just from looking at the left side of the equation, you would not know what these neurons are doing. But as soon as you realize the identity, uh, you do. Um, so. Um, I said I might have lost you in the math, but I should warn you that at the end of this um, section, the, at the end of these lectures, there will be a test in which you will be asked to derive this formula. Um, and I'll give you a little hint. It comes from our master equation. And, and if you think that's as unfair, uh, let me remind you that this is math that's being done in the brain of a fly. <laughs> okay. Um, I, can, I can repeat this story for multiple cell types in the central complex. I won't. I'm going to run out of time. But this is a cell type that I mentioned earlier in my talk that takes a goal direction signal and turns it into a steering signal. Tells the fly, if you want to go to this goal, turn left or turn right. And it can also be described by equations I'm not going to go through, but by trigonometric identities. The same thing. Um, so, so what's the upshot here? 
The upshot is that, you know, we take the normal things that we do in neuroscience, we take anatomy and we try to figure out how things are working, we add physiological function, but for, in particular for this system, if you put those together, it just falls out that you also need the mathematics of the trigonometric identities and it all falls out. So really what that means is that the fly, or that evolution I should say, discovered these trigonometric identities long before any humans did and, and somehow used them to select the right anatomy and the right physiology that could exploit those identities uh, to compute the, the, the kinds of things that the fly needs to navigate through the world. Um, okay, I'm going to end there and thank uh, the people I have to thank. Of course, the Gruber Foundation and the members of the Selection Committee. I want to thank all the people whose work I've described here today, uh, whose uh, beautiful work on the physiology of the system and the modeling uh, have, have made this talk possible. And then I, I want to thank many, many other people, uh, from uh, all the graduate students I've worked with up to all the senior researchers I've worked with. Um, they have made uh, this journey uh, prof uh, uh, productive and, if I may say so, beautiful. Also, thank you to all of you. Thank you. So I also want to begin by thanking the Gruber Foundation for this tremendous honor. It's both an honor to receive the award and also to share the stage with my distinguished colleagues. So I'm going to talk about anesthesia, the dynamics of the anesthetized brain, or the, the dynamics of anesthesia-mediated unconsciousness. And so these are some of the funding sources I've had the good fortune to enjoy. And I mentioned down at the bottom there's some potential conflicts of interest. But before I begin, I want to thank the people, or I should say the person, who's uh, been my, my biggest cheerleader for many years now. And I slipped the slide in after I saw what Haim said about his wife. So I thought I would th th thank my wife as well. And <laughs> so thank you. And now into the colleagues who do the dirty work. So my colleagues at, at Boston University, Laura Lewis, Nancy Capel, at Mass General Hospital, Maude Eskandar, Sid Cash, Shuna Keiju, Patrick Purden, and also at uh, WashU, uh, Shinung Chung. So this is the outline I'm going to follow. I'm going to review what I call Breme's principle. I'm going to talk about slow oscillations coming from propofol and ketamine, and I'm going to talk about other factors that generate slow oscillations. And the reason I'm doing this is that all anesthetics generate slow oscillations, but they do them through different mechanisms. And, and the different mechanisms reflect the different targets that the, that the anesthetics hit in the brain. I'm going to talk, that's what I'm going to go through. So let me just begin with a, a definition. What is general anesthesia? It's a drug-induced, drug-mediated, reversible state comprised of antinociception, unconsciousness, amnesia, akinesia, and physiological stability. And it's often said that it's not clear, well, one of the reasons it's important is to state this, because if you go through these first four conditions and you don't have the reversible there, that's like death, and that's not cool, all right? <laughs> so, but what we do is we create these states using drugs. We turn the brain into a state where you can, you, so you can undergo a traumatic event such as, a, such as a surgery. But it's often said it's not clear how anesthesia works. Nothing could be further from the truth. So let me just stop and just explain right now. Anesthetics work by creating oscillations in the brain circuits that impair the communication between different brain regions. And I'm going to show you that very explicitly in just a second. So let me begin with a little bit of history. So this is a diagram which is fashioned after work done by the well-known Belgian, Belgian physiologist Frederick Breme back in 1935. He did this in cats. And first what he did was he sectioned the brain at A, which is separating about most of the brain stem in the front the brainstem from the spinal cord. And when you looked at the EEG on these cats, 
he saw EEG patterns that looked like this, so awake appearing EEGs, and he called it the encephalies or the isolated encephalon. Then the second set of cats, he did experiments where he transected most, most of the pons and, and the medulla and the cord from a part of the, uh, the, the midbrain and the, and the cortex, and he called this silvo isole, and he saw what were slow oscillations. And so we've come to appreciate now that there's something in this part of the brain, like right down here in the, in the pons area there, which is responsible for arousal. So let's talk about... So and so what I'm going to show you is that anesthetics all have targets in those parts of the brain. So this is one of, the, one of the mechanisms, not the entire mechanism, but one of the mechanisms through which they generate these slow delta oscillations. So this is a, a schematic showing propofol. As you give increasing doses of propofol, how, the, how the, the oscillations change. You can see at the top, in an awake patient, you have low sort of high frequency, low amplitude oscillations. And if you get down to about D or E, you have these large oscillations at a, at a very low at a very low frequency. And that's what I'm going to be talking about is this particular state here, particularly the state with the slow and alpha oscillations. So if you maintain an infusion of propofol on someone having surgery, you'll get a pattern that looks like this, where you see these, the 10 hertz oscillation, the alpha oscillation, and the slow oscillation, as long as you maintain the infusion. And if you see, I turn the infusion off somewhere around 27 or 30, and the oscillations break up, and the person will come too. All right? So the oscillations are characteristic of all the drugs when in a person who's in an anesthetized state. Now I can draw a diagram here, like this one, and if I look down at the brainstem there and the red projections which come out of the, the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, this is area, uh, they're gabergic and gallinergic synapses. They're like my fingers, like this. And so my wrist is like that, the preoptic area of the hypothalamus. And it sends these gabergic projections, gallinergic projections, onto the major arousal centers. So when propofol comes up through the basilar artery, at the bottom of the brain stem, at the bottom of the, on the, on the, dorsal, on the dorsal surface of, the, of like the pons, and it, and it travels in through the projecting arteries there, it hits these, these synapses here, which are gabergic, and this is one of the mechanisms which it turns off the brain, and you see these large slow oscillations. So we can apply Bremet's principle here and infer that we would get slow oscillations. But I want to go a little bit further to show you what we've also seen experimentally. So this is work we did about 10 years ago now from Laura Lewis's PhD thesis in which we have patients who have epilepsy and they come for surgery to have the epileptic foci removed because they failed drug therapy. So they stay in the hospital for, se for several days with the grids and strips implanted until the, the epileptologist can locate the seizure foci. And you can, when they come back to the operating room for the, have the, the grids and strips removed, you have a natural experiment. You can look at what happens to neurons in the human brain when someone undergoes anesthesia. So if you look at here on the left, you can see the nice sort of irregular sort of awake patterns in the local field potentials, and a neuron which is near the red electrode spiking wherever it wants to. Now look what happens when slow oscillations start. When the, neuron, when the slow oscillations start, the neuron spikes roughly about every two seconds, about a half hertz oscillation. So the slow oscillation is strongly associated across the cortex with this very, very slow spiking activity of the neurons, which is reduced dramatically. So we're able to, last year, look at this in more detail in non-human primates, thanks to the work with Earl Miller at MIT. And so here's the same type of experiment now done in non-human primate. We have four areas, in the four cortical areas, 8A, prefrontal cortex, posterior parietal cortex, and superior temporal gyrus. And then we look at them when the animal's awake, and you see the nice sort of low amplitude oscillations. The neurons are spiking pretty much wherever they want to. The spiking activity is about 10, spikes per, 10 to 12 spikes per second. Now look what happens when the animal becomes unconscious and the, and the slow oscillations take, take over. You can see the spiking becomes very, very sparse. Moreover, there are these long down states. And in fact, to quantify this a bit, spiking activity goes from about 10 to 12 spikes per second down to one half to, to a half spike per second. Now, I can't tell you at what spike rate the animal would become unconscious. But I can tell you that this is the state that's being maintained when you see this. They're not going to be conscious. Going to be, there's no effective information transfer among these various cortical regions. So this is one, this is kind of like the signature of the, what the propofol slow oscillations are telling us. I, I want to contrast that here now with what happens with ketamine. So under ketamine, so this is work which has been, which is done by uh, Andy Garwood, who's one of my PhD students, and also Suresh Chakrabarty, who is, uh, Suresh Chakrabarty is one of my postdocs. And this is a pattern of ketamine in a, this is from the operating room, not from an animal experiment. And ketamine has this really cool pattern. It's very high frequency oscillations in the gamma range, 
when you give a sedative dose, like the doses that are used to treat patients for depression, or the doses we use just to sedate someone or for, for, with analgesia for uh, a small procedure. So then when you give an increasing dose, so you can use ketamine just as a single anesthetic by itself, you get this really neat pattern where you have high-frequency oscillations High-frequency oscillations alternating with slow oscillation. It goes high-frequency, slow, high-frequency, slow, every about four to 10 seconds. And so the high-frequency we understand by the work, from the work of Bidamo Gadam many years ago that pointed out that one of the things that ketamine does is that it, it preferentially blocks inhibitory interneurons at low doses. So that it helps us understand why the parameter neurons get released and you have more activity. And then in higher doses, it gets the parameter neurons and, excuse me, gets the the inhibitory neurons and the parameter neurons, and so we, we start seeing the, the, the slow oscillations. So, but what Indy did was, we did a series of experiments in non-human primates to look at this in more detail. And so we just, if you take this area here, the little, you can see the, the high frequency oscillations as well as the slow oscillations, and then if you look over the side and the panel is blown up, you can see the high frequency oscillations and slow oscillations, and they just don't go high, low, high, low. There's actually a transition period where you have low, a little bit of high, a little bit more high, then finally the high, and so forth. And if you see here on the right, you can see there are like four states. And so she mapped these out in very de great detail with a hidden Markov model. So it there's, a, there's a very organized march among these states. And the interesting thing about this, if you look at the average spike rate, the average spike rate during these times is actually quite stable in the sense that the spike rates are just like the, they were when the animal was awake. But during the high frequency periods, the spike rate increases. In the low frequency period, it actually decreases quite a bit. And if you look across the entire brain, you get a pattern that looks something like this. So over here on the right, you can see the, the, the patterns going across the various brain regions of this sort of hidden Markov model. And they're, they're really in lock sync. So like 50% of the time, as you can see in the first row, the, the oscillations are in sync across, two, across all the areas. About 70% of the time in the posterior areas, the superior temporal gyrus and then the posterior parietal cortex. And the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex in 8A are in sync about 80% of the time. So these are high, highly structured oscillations that are now in sync across large parts of the cortex. So that contrasts quite a bit from the picture I just showed you with, uh, what I showed you with, uh, with propofol. So what other factors affect slow delta oscillations? So, in very young brains, so if this is a young, this is a child who's under three months of age, anesthetized with sevoflurane. So sevoflurane, like propofol, works on GABAergic circuits. So if you just have a, a very young child, you anesthetize them with propofol or sevoflurane, all you're going to see are slow oscillations, right? The alpha oscillations, which I showed you in the, in the, in the, in the patients earlier, don't appear until the child is about, mm, about four months of age. Something magical happens at four months. And this is where anesthesia sort of helped us to see a little bit into, the, see a little bit into uh, brain development. We think that what's happening there, the reason you don't have the alpha oscillations when the child is younger, is because the, um, the thalamocortical connections aren't sufficiently formed to generate these dynamics, because our work, our experimental work, as well as our modeling work, has actually shown us that, that this oscillation goes back and forth between the thalamus and cortex. So if the brain isn't mature enough to produce it, you don't see it. Then on the other end of the age spectrum, as we get older, we lose our ability to produce the alpha oscillation. And this is a very typical pattern for a person who's elderly. And elderly could be not necessarily in the 60s or 70s, but in the 50s in many cases. And so what's happening here is the fidelity with which the dynamics are being trans trans transmitted sort of across these synapses and across these circuits just starts to degenerate with time. You don't have to invoke Alzheimer's, you don't have to invoke dementia, any of that. We just have a neuron which has been around for 78 years and it doesn't extend its dendrites as well. It doesn't produce as much neurotransmitter. The mitochondria don't work as well. The cell volume declines. So you have basically the wiring, the myelin sheath breaks down. So you have a wiring system that's actually just getting older. And a, and a final case is in patients who have overwhelming sepsis. We see just pure sort of slow oscillations. And we, see in a lot, we saw a lot of, this is a case I took care of, a gentleman who was a drug addict who was coming to the operating room every few days to have a wound debrided. And so what, when I, the first time I brought him, that I brought him down there, I was curious as what his EEG looked like. When I looked at his EEG, he had only slow oscillations. And it really surprised me because he's a fairly young guy. Then we started to sort of put it together with the slow oscillations. In this case, what's happening is this inflammatory response. You know, when you become ill, you have a cold, you don't feel like running a marathon. 
you know, you want to rest or what have you. And so Mark Ott out of Wash U has shown, University of Washington has shown that the, um, that the inflammatory mediators actually bind to the, the arousal centers and turn them off. And that makes sense. And so this one of the following Breme's principles, we'd expect to see something like slow oscillations. What I'm looking to see is a case now where someone has had these, had these infections clear up and we re-anesthetize them and see if their alpha oscillations have actually come back. So what have I just shown you? So all anesthetics produce these slow delta oscillations, likely through inactivation of the brainstem, projection of the thalamus and cortex, and also through direct sort of hyperpolarization of the thalamus and cortex. The propofol mediates slow oscillations. We saw that you get this very large decline in spiking activity relative to the conscious state. And if you look at what happens with ketamine, there you, the spike rates are pretty much the same. What you have is a very, a quite altered dynamic. And I showed you some other factors that can also produce these slow and delta oscillations because you have to interpret them in context, not just enough to say, oh, I see a slow oscillation, therefore the person must be unconscious. No, you have to understand the context that actually produces it and other, well, the factors that contribute to it. So it can be brain development, brain aging, and also patient health. So what I'm showing is there are different dynamics and signatures in the anesthetic that, that have different, there are different dynamics. You can have the same dynamic but with different, basically, mechanisms. And so I just want to thank all my collaborators, postdocs, grad students, undergrads, clinical coordinators, and technicians who made this possible. Thank you. We um, are going to go into some questions, so thank you so much to all our speakers, and we have been given about a five-minute extension, and we would like to have you um, please uh, submit your, speakers, uh, your questions through the app, um, and the speakers will all come up, and we will have a few time for about three or four questions, I think, so uh, please. Um, all right, so uh, we um, have some interesting questions here, I think. Uh, Sorry. Like to. We just we're going to, like was. What? I, I was saying. Like to ask um, a a question that sort of is general to the group while you're assembling yourselves. Um, how do you think? Maybe this is a good question for Dr. Sumpolinsky. Um, how are AI and neuroscience going to impact each other in the future? Uh, what is next? Okay, thank you for uh, raising uh, this question. Um, as in all other sciences, uh, AI uh, revolutionized uh, neuroscience in that provided powerful new tools for data analysis, for neural data analysis, anatomical uh, and uh, dynamical, physiological, also behavioral. However, unlike other sciences, the relation, the interaction, the impact between AI and neuroscience is unique, uh, forming what's known as a virtuous circle. Because for the first time in the history of science or neuroscience, due to AI, we have currently a, a powerful artificial network models that to some degree resemble the architecture of real brains, the, the type of uh, dynamics, uh, the style of learning, and they show performances which are human-level performances in some areas, like vision, recognition, uh, decision-making, reinforcement learning, etc. So, for the first time, we have models that we can use to test hypotheses as if it is another species or another biological model system. Use those models to test hypotheses, to reject hypotheses, to refine hypotheses about the real brain. And this is going to change the way we ask questions, the nature of the questions we ask about the brain, and the nature of experiments that we do in order to test uh, hypotheses. On the other hand, we have to admit that AI present uh, far lags, lags behind the human level intelligence in many dimensions. In its uh, human intelligence is robust, robust in generalization, in transfer of knowledge, uh, in lifelong uh, uh, learning and memory, 
and many other aspects. So, by a neural science discovery of the uh, neural mechanisms of human intelligence in the brain, we are going to revolution, revolutionize AI and to generate the next generation of much more powerful machines uh, that will better mimic a human level performance. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so here's another question uh, that actually uh, I think, uh, Emery, you may want to uh, address. It's similar to the first question in a sense, but what is next about implementation of these computational theories in the biomedical and clinical world and perhaps in your area of anesthesia? Well, well I think specifically for anesthesiology, what we have to do is we have to change our mindset. So right now, when we look for insights into developing new concepts or new constructs or new drugs, we look to pharmacology. And I think we have to start basing our thinking more soundly on neuroscience because, I mean, after all, the drugs are acting in the brain. Ironically, we have, uh, we have standards to monitor heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, CO2 delivery, but we have no standards which require you to monitor the brain. So beginning very simply, just learning to monitor. But then as we... As you've seen, like the models, which have been models, both computational models, molecular neuroscience models, systems neuroscience models, actively explore those areas to try to develop new approaches to doing anesthesia. And, and just to show you how much, work there, how much work there is to be done, we haven't had a new anesthetic in 30 years. So I think there's a lot to, that, that can be done by just, just, first of all, just bringing neuroscience into, into the thinking about anesthesiology and also into the practice. Thank you. And now um, my colleague, Dr. Ikui Mori, is going to ask the next question that we found. Oh, thank you very much for all the wonderful talks. So all of you are pioneers, and can you tell us how the field has changed since its start? Maybe uh, Larry? Yeah, I'll take that on. I, I think, you know, the problems have almost inverted. When, when we all started, there was a lot known about single-cell biophysics. There were beautiful single-cell recordings. And I think the job of the theorist was to take that single-cell knowledge, try to put it together into a circuit and make some conjectures about what would happen at the circuit level, uh, maybe test some things and like that. Nowadays, you know, we have recordings from thousands and thousands of cells. We have connectome data. We have lists of cell types. We have gigantic amounts of data. And, and it's almost turned backwards that I think the theoretical challenge is to take that gigantic data set and extract from it some sort of uh, meaning that, that isn't just a list but gives you a sense of what it's all there for. And so I do think in the next generation the skill set will be somewhat different, and it'll become a reducing rather than a generating uh, uh, process that we do in theoretical neuroscience. Thank you. And um, I think this is maybe a great question to sort of <laughs> wrap up with. Um, here's one that is uh, pretty profound, pretty wide. What is the difference between AI and your brain? And we wonder whether this was written by a bot or a person. <laughs> Well, uh, there's a revolution that has occurred in AI over the last 10 years. When um, I was a graduate student, AI was dominated by symbol processing, by rules, logic. And 10 years ago, uh, it shifted when computing power became available to simulate very large-scale network models that uh, have, as you heard from Haim, have been used to attack many of the difficult problems and what's, uh, what, what the, the difference is that um, uh, biology evolves uh, with very low power computing, massive, uh, massively parallel, and uh, use learning as a way to construct circuits as well as the uh, developmental structures that appear uh, as, you are, uh, as your brain is growing. And that's what uh, AI now is doing, is it's adopted the, that architecture massively parallel, and it's also adopted learning. Instead of writing programs, computer programs, it learns through examples. You give it uh, data, you give it uh, text. And just within the last three years has been a fantastic shift that has occurred in AI. Uh, it went from uh, 
label data, for example, objects that you have to discriminate, to uh, self-supervise. And what does that mean? It means you don't have to label anything. You just give it lots of structured data, like text. And then um, you have a hierarchy, like the one Heim showed you. And what you do is you ask, you train it by asking the network to predict the next word in the sentence. It gets better and better and better, and finally it gets to the point where it can not just predict the next word, but you can take that and then loop it back and it'll produce the next word and the next word, which means that it, it can start talking to you, which was a great shock to a lot of us. Uh, and, and you can ask questions, uh, you can train it up on Wikipedia and many other texts, and it has great knowledge, but it's, it's eerily human, but it's not human. And, and the difference now between the brain and these large language models is that we should be able to analyze the large language models because we have access to every single unit, every single connection, every single uh, activity pattern, right? It's, we're reaching that point for the brain, but not nearly as complete. And now mathematicians are going in and understanding the same way that uh, Larry showed you and Heim showed you using uh, differential equations, but also geometry and uh, trigonometry. We, we should be able to understand the structure of, of what it is in these language models that allows the languages, the language to emerge from it. It's, it's really shocking uh, in, in many respects. But that then will transfer, that theoretical analysis will transfer to understanding better how the brain generates language and many, many other uh, in, uh, uh, aspects of intelligence. So all I can say is I think AI is catching up with us. <laughs> it's hard to say, it's not gonna be the same. Uh, obviously, uh, nature gave us much, much more efficient processing using neurons and molecular level computing, but um, it's, it's, it's accelerating. It's really astonishing how fast things are evolving. Well, thank you. And on that note, I'm passing this over to Dr. Trigiano. Well, wonderful. Thanks to all of you for this really fascinating discussion. And um, congratulations on uh, this prize. And this concludes um, the Gruber program.